With just a second grade education and three dollars in his pocket, Sidney Poitier came to the Big Apple for his slice. He worked as a dishwasher, slept on a roof, and in the bus station. On a whim, he tried acting. He stunk, as the director told him, but he didn't agree, so he studied hard. With determination, intelligence, and guts, Sidney Poitier forged a path for himself as a black leading man. It's a path that opened doors for other black talent to follow. His father was a tomato farmer from Cat Island who would take his produce to Florida by sailboat. He was on such a trip that Sidney Poitier was born in Miami on February 20th, 1927. The seventh and last child of Evelyn and Reginald Poitier was two months premature. Not expecting the baby to survive, Reginald built a shoebox casket. My father was a very interesting man. He was the poorest man in the village in the Caribbean where I, I grew up. My mom? She was an angel. She was the principal influence in my life. In the midst of the Depression, Sidney and his family left their hard scrabble life on Cat Island for the Bahamas' capital city. I am ten and a half years old, coming into the harbor of Nassau, where I saw what looked to me like beetles running up and down the, the shore. And I said, what are those, to my mom? And she said, those are cars. I said, cars? I said, wow. Young men and women coming from the West Indies had a whole different sense of the world in which they lived. I think there's a difference when you live in a country where there's a majority black community, where you get a sense that someday you will be independent, someday you will be in control of your life. Your sense of being has another place in which to, to to look for a future. In America, where you're the minority, there is always this sense of enormous futility. With only a year and a half of schooling, Sidney, with his three best friends, got into petty thievery. To discipline him, Reginald sent his 15-year-old son to Miami to live with his older brother, Cyril. I've taken your gun and this lady with me. In Nassau, Sidney loved going to the Western shoot 'em ups, starring his hero Bob Steele. In Miami, he encountered the real gunplay of police who put a pistol to his head for laughs when he wandered into a white neighborhood at night. I was not reared to accept that kind of behavior from anybody. And when it started coming to me in Florida, uh, and I started saying, hey, who the hell are you talking to? Uh, shocked a lot of people, I'm afraid. Poitier already had self-confidence. What he didn't have was a future in Miami. With the equivalent of a second grade education and three dollars in his pocket, he boarded a Greyhound bus to New York City. I asked a guy at the bus station, where is Harlem? And he said, if you go outside, there is a, a stairway down in the ground, and underneath the ground, you're going to find a train. And I said to myself, yeah, sure, I'll find a train under the ground, right? Poitier got a job washing dishes in a Times Square coffee shop. Unknown to him then, only a few blocks away, Paul Robeson, the actor, singer, and left-wing political activist, was starring in Shakespeare's Othello. I slept in the toilet at the bus station. Then I switched from there to the rooftop of the Brill Building. Poitier moved to Harlem, where he was inadvertently caught up in a race ride. He was shot through the leg and treated the wound himself. To escape New York's brutal winter, he lied about his age and enlisted in the Army. Miserable with military regulation, he feigned craziness and then told his psychiatrist the truth. In exchange for participating in a research project, after a little more than a year, just before his 18th birthday, Sidney was honorably discharged. He wrote to President Roosevelt for a $100 loan to pay his way back home to the Bahamas. He received no reply and moved back to New York City. One day I'm looking in the Amsterdam News for a dishwashing job and the opposite page was the theatrical page. And on the theatrical page there was this streamer that said actors wanted. Hey, I figured I tried one, might as well give the other a go. He auditioned at the famed American Negro Theater with co-founder Frederick O'Neill. He said to me, he said, why don't you stop wasting people's time and go out and get yourself a job as a dishwasher or something? 
And I decided on that moment that I was going to be an actor and I was going to prove to that man that I could be other than a dishwasher and commensurately prove it to myself. And now the curtain rises on the third act of Dodie Smith's gay comedy success, Call It A Day. Poitier spent hours each day mimicking the announcers on the radio, slowly losing his thick West Indian accent. You know, Sidney was uh, hugely inarticulate at the beginning, but we thought it might have been through some psychological, you know, uh, uh, consequence. In fact, it was that he just could not command the English language. Six months later, in his one good suit, Sidney, reading from True Confessions magazine, was accepted for a three-month tryout, but only because 40 women and no men had passed the audition. No hint of the tremendous power he had as an actor, or that he would make it uh, uh, to Hollywood and make it to the top. Poitier was cast as the understudy to a new student also from the West Indies. He was tall, good-looking, and he, he was very bright, and naturally, I looked at this guy as an, a threat. And let me tell you, Belafonte saw Poitier the same way. Uh, we were looking at one another, wondering, each of us wondering what the other was doing there. Filling in one night for Belafonte, Poitier was spotted by a Broadway director for an all-black adaptation of a Greek classic. Cast as a meek Athenian courier, he had 12 lines. The curtain goes up, and I'm in the first scene, and I froze. But the audience starts laughing. So I, I get more nervous, and I keep giving the wrong line. So at the end of my little thing, I got off the stage, and I said, well, I'm, you know, this acting thing is not for me. It's, I'm, I'm finished. It's over, and I'm going to get out of here and go back to dishwashing. But the reviewers, believing his nervousness to be an act, loved him. So began the acting career of young Sidney Poitier. In one of his earliest plays, he worked with Ruby Dee, who with her husband, Ossie Davis, would become among Poitier's closest friends. He also met Juanita Hardy, a college graduate and a model. She was uh, warm, witty, a beautiful girl, and supportive of Sidney. She had plans, and she had a sense of business, and getting ahead and, and that kind of thing. In 1949, Poitier's star was on the rise. He had one offer to appear in an anti-apartheid play on Broadway and another from director Joseph Mankiewicz to star in the racial drama No Way Out. He chose Hollywood. What is it, Dr. Brooks? This man is still in the scalpel. He's got it hidden on him. I want him searched. Hand it over, Biddle. I ain't got it, Doc. Are you sure there's one missing? I checked out three, Dr. Horton. We've only found two. He's had every opportunity to take it. Miss Blake and I had our backs to him most of the time. The scalpels were lying right here on the instrument table. And all he had to do was... I was a racist bigot. I just met him, and we embarked on a scene where I had to call him everything under the sun. And I, 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 it was just terrible. So after... Every expletive, I'd run up to him and say, Sid, it, it's not me, it's, it's, it's just a character, you understand? And his eyes would blaze, you know, when I was doing the scene, but afterward he was very understanding. Having landed his first movie role, Poitier felt secure enough to marry Juanita. He also felt successful enough to revisit his family in Nassau. His parents hadn't heard from him in eight years. I worked in South Africa some years ago. I made a film there. I worked there for 16 weeks. And I found uh, South Africa uh, on a racial, a political, a social level, the worst place I've ever been. In 1952, his next film took Poitier to South Africa for the first time. In Cry the Beloved Country, playing opposite the outspoken stage and screen actor Canada Lee, Sidney signed papers making him the director's indentured slave so that he could legally work in the country. Three years and two forgettable films would pass before Poitier would get another formidable role. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Are you a member of the Communist Party? With McCarthyism at its height, and because of his friendships with Canada Lee and Paul Robeson, Poitier would later claim he had been blacklisted. Paul's advice was, you know, don't follow me 
uh, when it becomes dangerous for your own career. You know, go as far as you think you can, but when the time comes to uh, back off, that's what you'll have to do. Uh, Sidney certainly was faced with this. I saw the evidence of the blacklist that he was on. Uh, his crime being that he was a roommate of Canada Lee, a man that I admired greatly and that he admired greatly. To make ends meet, Poitier went back to washing dishes and construction work. Later, he became a partner in a money pit of a restaurant called Ribs in the Rough, advertising his secret Caribbean sauce, which a friend compared to spicy glue. He and Juanita moved to an attic apartment in Astoria, Long Island. They had two daughters, Beverly and Pamela. He would write in his autobiography, the word daddy held some magical connotations for me. Finally, in 1955, director Richard Brooks cast the 28-year-old Poitier as a juvenile delinquent in Blackboard Jungle. The film created a sensation, and Sidney was sensational in the role. His performance in Blackboard Jungle should have made him a star. But once again, Sidney Poitier found himself out of work. Stay tuned as our celebration of black culture continues on Bio Channel. The reviews Poitier received for Blackboard Jungle should have guaranteed him steady work, but the year was 1956. That was not so heartbreaking to do a, a part as good as Blackboard Jungle and have no offers for anything. There weren't that many parts for black actors in those days. Agent Martin Baum had seen Poitier in Blackboard Jungle and approached him about another film, his role, A Vengeful Janitor. He said, Mr. Baum, well, someday uh, black people are going to play something more than men's room attendants and Pullman car porters, and uh, I want to be there when that happens. And I don't want to play this. I need it desperately, but I, I can't do it. I said, uh, I respect your, your integrity and I respect your point of view. I'd like to sign you to an exclusive contract. Charlie, he's nothing. I mean, he can't hurt you. He can't hurt you. Like in my life, Charlie ain't that much. Poitier's first job represented by Baum was in a television drama called A Man is Ten Feet Tall. He would reprise his role as a good-hearted dock worker in the film version retitled Edge of the City co-starring newcomer John Cassavetes. The thing is, a man's got to make a choice. You know, I mean, there are the men, and then there are the lower forms, and a guy's got to make a choice. You go with the men, and you're 10 feet tall. You go with the lower forms, and you are down in the slime. Well, what happens if you don't want to go with anybody? Then you are alone, man, and that's the worst thing. In 1947, Maverick producer Stanley Kramer featured James Edwards in one of the few Hollywood movies to star a black actor in a serious role. A decade later, for The Defiant Ones, he cast Sidney Poitier as an escaped Southern convict chained to a white racist. Go on, tell me all that big talk about Charlie Potatoes. When the chain's off and nobody's chasing you, come on, you can't, can you? You can't because you're nothing. You're not even a man, you're a monkey on a stick. That crack a mob back there, they pull the string and you jump. It was the first film that allowed a black actor and a white actor to reciprocate, to coexist, to share top billing. If you've looked at a person through a camera lens as often as I've looked at Sidney Poitier, you know no matter what the role, no matter how he played it, when I looked through that lens, I saw the man. He dominated that lens. The film's final scene, in which Sidney sacrifices his freedom trying to rescue the white man he has come to befriend, provoked a caustic response from noted black writer James Baldwin, who remarked that in the white movie theaters, audiences cheered. In black theaters, they shouted at Sidney to get back on the train. For their performances, Poitier and Curtis both received Academy Award nominations for Best Actor. That, that was a token nomination, believe me when I tell you. For both of us, a black guy and a Jew guy. I mean, I rest my case. Who wins it? Uh, 
Was it uh, David Niven for separate tables? Ugh. Poche may never have received his $100 loan from FDR, but for the defiant ones, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt presented him with the Berlin Film Festival's award for Best Actor. Achievements would not be just professional. Juanita and Sydney had a third daughter, Sherry, and moved into a 14-room house in the integrated New York suburb of Mount Vernon. We were neighbors, we were friends, and we were in deep and high communion with each other. For his next film, Poitier was cast as Porgy in Gershwin's racial folk opera, Porgy and Bess. The role had originally been turned down by Harry Belafonte. The NAACP pressured him to withdraw from what it perceived to be an idealized minstrel show. Poitier asked producer Sam Goldwyn for script approval. His reply? No one looks at my movies before they are made but me. Goldwyn told him he could destroy his career. And Sidney Poitier, who had walked out on Porgy and Bess, walked back in. The image of a black man on his knees, you know, you don't have to say any more. It, it really is one of the things that, you know, really gets our goat. So here comes our boy Sidney on his knees, and uh, he has to pay a certain price for that. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Stung by the criticism over Porgy and Bess, Poitier attempted to publicly downplay his image as the black actor's standard bearer. The roles that he did depended upon uh, being African-American, and uh, he, he was aware of that. But nonetheless, he had a, there was a joy, a joyousness in the work. Poitier returned to the stage as the beleaguered Walter Lee Younger in Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. Directed by fellow American Negro Theater alumnus Lloyd Richards, and once again featuring Ruby Dee as his wife. I've never seen him work so hard. I remember feeling that Sidney was going at it for the first time. I thought it was so wonderful to watch him work in that. Two years after the play began its initial run, he appeared in the movie version. One of his most powerful scenes comes as he beseeches his God fearing mother, played by Claudia McNeil to use her husband's life insurance check to finance his own business, a liquor store. But, Mommy, you haven't even looked at it. You haven't even looked at it. You haven't even looked at it and you don't even have to speak on it again? Well, you tell that to my boy tonight when you put him to sleep on the living room couch. And you tell it to him in the morning when his mother goes out of here to take care of somebody else's kids. I tell it to me when we want some curtains or some drapes and you sneak out of here and go work in somebody's kitchen. All I want is to make a future for this family. All I want is to be able to stand in front of my boy like my father never was able to do to me and tell him that he'll be somebody in this world besides a servant and a chauffeur. Huh? You tell me that, huh? Actress and singer Diane Carroll first met Sidney Poitier as a bit player in Porgy and Bess. In her autobiography, she described her first impression of him. The door opened, he stepped inside, my life changed. Sidney was the kind of man that when he married, he didn't uh, want, in our understanding, somebody who was also a performer, who was also uh, uh, with a different and independent career of their own. But Poitier was infatuated with Diane Carroll, and two years later, they starred as lovers opposite Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward in Paris Blues. But I love you. I love you. After several attempts to save their marriage, Sidney obtained a Mexican divorce from Juanita. He announced his engagement to Diane Carroll, but they never did cross the altar. Pressured by demands of a major career, his marriage over, Poitier flew to Miami Beach to talk to Harry Belafonte. We were ripped apart on a lot of levels, emotionally and politically and socially and, and artistically. And I took to analysis, psychoanalysis. I saw in him that he was in exactly the same place I was, and that perhaps if he would try this scientific approach, this uh, to, to, it might cause him to find some relief and some 
truth and some strength and was to go on. In 1961, Poitier began intensive psychotherapy that lasted more than a decade. That same year, his parents, Evelyn and Reginald Poitier, died just months apart. And every time I took a part from the first part, from the first day, I always said to myself, this must reflect well on his name. Lilies of the Field was filmed in just two weeks at a cost of $247,000. It was the story of an itinerant handyman who helps a group of German nuns. He built a chapel. Very nice. What's a chapel? And a kleine Kirche. A chapel. Lots of luck, Mother. I ain't building no chapel. Yeah, you. Not only am I ain't building no chapel, I'm taking off. I ain't no contractor. That is for the beginning. No! With this performance, the Poitier name would become Hollywood Gold. It had been a long journey. And though in the past, it had been my pleasure to walk side by side with him and, you know, to be one of the boys. But now we'd come to the river and he had to get cross. And in order to get cross, he had to swim. And I didn't know how to swim. I didn't know how to help him. I think I proved correct in that because he moved into territories where I could give him no advice based on my experiences whatsoever. Hollywood's big night. In 1964, Sidney Poitier became the first of his race to receive an Academy Award as Best Actor. It is a long journey to this moment. I am naturally indebted to countless numbers of people. For all of them, all I should say is a very special thank you. We were extraordinarily excited, Ossie and I, when, when Sydney won the Oscar. Uh, we saw it on television, and get, we, it was just, we couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't get over it. Poitier returned to Nassau for a hometown hero's welcome. He also made a point of visiting the three unmarked graves of his childhood friends, all dead of alcoholism. Back in the States, Sidney's breakthrough did not significantly deepen Hollywood's racial complexion. The joke going around the studios was, if you can't get Poitier, rewrite it for a white actor. Post-Oscar, even Sidney's parts were none too stellar. Yeah. I brought you a present. Take it. Put them on. It's glasses. Not quite. They're sunglasses. There, just as I thought. What? Now you're a very pretty girl. Oh, you pulled my leg. <laughs> no, I mean it. McAllister said you wanted to kill me. I'd rather get it over with now if the thought's still in your mind. Sidney played out his childhood fantasy, making his first Western. He looked good in a cigar. He was announced for projects that never materialized as he read from the classics. I think, for instance, that if there is anything beautiful other than absolute beauty, it can be beautiful only insofar as it partakes of absolute beauty. He deepened his commitment to civil rights, realizing his celebrity could prove useful to the cause. Then I also want to thank my friend, Sidney Poitier, certainly one of the great performing artists of the world. Sidney Poitier comes to all of us bearing great gifts. His appearance on the world stage was significant because at the time the eyes of the entire world were on the civil rights movement in America. But Poitier still fought his standard bearer image. I think anybody who becomes celebrity uh, who comes from the black community is required to have a position on where the race is going and where we go as a people. When you do that often enough, you begin to wonder, especially as life begins to move on, when do I get a chance to be something other than a spokesperson for race? 
I remember um, uh, watching television one evening, and uh, uh, it was a, a news interview, and he was on his way someplace, and it was during the 60s and in the middle of the civil rights era. And something, and I don't recall exactly what it was, um, had, had happened just that day. And he was questioned about it. It was the first time I ever saw him snap. You know, it seems to me that at this moment, this day, you could ask me many questions about many positive and wonderful things that are happening in this country. But we gather here to pay court to sensationalism. We gather here to pay court to negativism. You guys have a job to do. Uh, I'm a relatively intelligent man. There are many aspects to my personality that you can explore, I think, uh, very uh, constructively. But you sit here and ask me such one-dimensional questions about a very tiny area of our lives. You ask me questions that fall continually within the negroness of my life. You ask me questions that pertain to the narrow scope of the summer riots. I am artist, man, American, contemporary. I am an awful lot of things, so I wish you would uh, pay me the respect due and not simply ask me about those things. It was 1967. Thurgood Marshall was named to the Supreme Court. The 58-year-old Negro thus becomes the first of his race to serve on the land's highest court. I know that the vast majority of Negroes and whites are shocked and are outraged by them. America was torn apart by race riots, and Sidney Poitier would appear in three landmark films, becoming the most popular motion picture star in the world. As in as Carnaby Street, as hard as the streets of London. Sidney Poitier, in a role worthy of his Academy Award winning talents, as the teacher who joins battle with the wildest set of rebels London ever produced. What is it, the matter? Those kids are devils incarnate, huh? They did it because they felt the picture was an uplifting look at the way kids could be taught. And it was a positive statement about being kids from all colors and, and ethnic backgrounds working and living together. Well, you're pretty sure you're something, ain't you, Virgil? Now, Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigger boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs? Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs. Take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now. It was in the heat of the night which confronted a racial problem in the country in such a focused way that that the relationship between he and Rod Steiger and in that film uh, had tremendous impact. We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say last night about midnight? Some old guy smacks him in the face and he smacks him back. I mean, it's like... That was... that was brave stuff. I haven't even told you his name. <laughs> Mommy, it's John Wade Prentice. Isn't that a lovely name? John Wade... Joanna Prentice, I'll be. Stanley Kramer's Guess Who's Coming to Dinner confronted the issue of interracial marriage. The couple's single on-screen kiss and interracial movie first was shown in a rear-view mirror. Even then, I took a terrible beating because everybody said, that's Poitier. Ah, oh, you picked the best-looking guy, the most personable of all the blacks. In 1969, three of the most powerful actors in Hollywood formed the independent production company First Artists allowing them to control the financing and distribution of their films. 
Poitier made The Lost Man and there met his future wife, Joanna Shimkus. The Lost Man, in which Poitier plays a revolutionary, was his response to the increasing militancy in the American civil rights movement. It was not a success. The black militancy of the late 1960s brought its own backlash. The Sunday New York Times printed an article by playwright Clifford Mason challenging Poitier's appeal. You come along, you're a big star, you win uh, the Oscars. I mean, everything is fantastic. And have you criticized the system as an actor, as a writer, as a director? Have you pointed a finger at anybody? Huh? No. So, you know, so what does, that, what does that say? I mean, that has to leave a sour taste in the mouth of, of, of blacks. The mob wanted Harlem back. They got Shaq. Okay, turn it loose, so he goes. Come on, turn him. In the era of black exploitation films, Sidney Poitier's elegance was being held against him. He was a Cary Grant, and uh, we wanted a Humphrey Bogart or a Gary Cooper. And the fact of the matter is, Cary Grant was only half the hero that we needed. Cary Grant grew up in poverty in England, and like Poitier, went alone to New York City, a penniless teenager, and worked hard to remove his thick accent. His elegance, like Sidney's, was hard won. Some of the white men have taken our land. Poitier had other precursors besides Cary Grant. Actors like Juano Hernandez, Canada Lee, Paul Robeson, and Lee Whipper, who all brought passion and dignity to their characterizations of black Americans. But when you are where Sidney is, and all of a sudden somebody says you must get into this kind of a silly Hollywood rhythm of action films and violence and, 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 and caricature of black life, under the banner of new black voices being heard and and then and, and militancy because none of it was militant there was no militancy in it at all black exploitation films were designed to exploit black anger and rage and what you got from those films was nothing of value his choices were basically uh, image conscious if he felt the image of the person he was playing was detrimental to his race, he wouldn't play it. What he did and the way he did it uh, is amazing. It absolutely is. And yet at the same time, I too am a black man. There were points when I, I would have to say, Sidney, hey man, you give, you're giving away too much. You, you know, you're letting them off the hook or you're kissing their behinds or whatever. But he did it. And he did it to some degree because he had to. So I guess part of what we wanted Sidney to do was to bring us the whole way. And I guess it was asking for too much. Poitier built a mansion in Nassau and spent more and more time away from Hollywood. He also began his career as a director. After stepping in for the director fired from Buck and the Preacher, a film about former slaves homesteading in the Wild West. Uh, we thought that black people played an important part in the building of the West. We want black children to see that. Uh, we couldn't spend an hour and a half showing black children uh, what black people did in the West unless we made it entertaining. That same year, Joanna and Sidney had their first child, Anika. A year later, yet another daughter, Sidney, was born. He continued to direct. Sidney Poitier, his love, Esther Anderson, her December, a warm December. Beginning in 1974, Poitier directed a series of extremely profitable comedies that were intended to provide black audiences with wholesome laughs instead of over-the-top violence. By day, they're two average family men enjoying a well-earned vacation with their wives in New Orleans. But by night, they're dynamite operators. Sidney is a very interesting person, you know. On one hand, as there's pontificating, articulate person, you would think he's an English professor. But if you look in his eyes, there's that little kid out of wherever he came out of, you know. 
struggling to be free, if you will. A part of the canard about black folks is that they're always laughing and singing and dancing. So in order to impress the world that we are serious people, you know, we have to wipe the smile off our faces from some time. And I suppose Sidney wiped it off and let it stay off. But behind it all, Sidney is a man who can laugh and does. I can say something that's really sad in retrospect, and that is the films that I criticized him for had more artistic value than the ones that he was doing to, to, answer, the, <laughs> to answer the criticism. So there's an irony for you. The black backlash against Poitier continued. The playwright Imamu Amari Baraka penned a vicious attack against Sidney called Sidney Poet Heroical that was staged eight times in New York. After two children and five years together, Poitier married Joanna Shimkus. His appearance the following year in A Piece of the Action was his last piece of acting for ten years. He continued to direct. Stir Crazy, released in 1980, became Columbia Studios' most popular comedy. That same year, this intensely private man published his autobiography. I think what happened was that there was just ten years when nobody wanted to write any longer to the kind of movie Sidney was known for. Uh, there was a whole other rhythm in, 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 in the culture. And uh, he just could not find scripts. And rather than do anything, he did nothing. Let me put it this way. My self-definition is very much a part of the work I do. And I am not about to be untrue to that. I won't be able to, to live with myself. Celebrate black culture with us on Bio Channel. In 1987, at the age of 60, Sidney Poitier resumed his acting career. The decade he sat out coincided with Hollywood's reliance on blockbuster sci-fi and teen movies. In the New York Times, he explained, it became more difficult to go back because the kind of material Hollywood was offering even to gifted actors, Redford, Newman, Hoffman, was not becoming to their stature. But actors like Redford, Newman, and Hoffman did take on major roles in that period. For a black actor in his 60s, the reality might have been different. Poitier played an FBI agent in Shoot to Kill, an action role that required him to sprint and scramble. In Little Nikita, he was once again an FBI agent in a supporting role to River Phoenix, the part was originally written for a white actor. It would be almost four years before he would act in another feature film. Meanwhile, he continued to direct. A hit Broadway show was spun off the real life of a black con artist pretending to be the son of Sidney Poitier in order to entice his way into the homes of rich white New York liberals. He named the greatest black star in movies. Sydney. No names, no names. We're trying to keep this abstract, plus libel laws. The play became a film with Donald Sutherland, Stockard Channing, and Will Smith. They never mentioned you. Well, what are they supposed to say? We've become friends with the son of Sidney Poitier, barrier breaker of the 50s and 60s. <laughs> Your father means a great deal in South Africa. Well, I'm glad of that. Dad and I went to Russia once to a film festival. He was truly amazed how much his presence meant. Oh, no. Tell us stories of movie stars tying up their children, being cruel. <laughs> Poitier made no public statement, but he was displeased with both the play and the real-life incident that inspired it. The honors and the Lifetime Achievement Awards rolled in. To the young African-American filmmakers who have arrived on the playing field, I am filled with pride that you are here. I am sure you have, like me, discovered it was never impossible. It was just harder. In 1991, he acted in a television show for the first time in 30 years, playing Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Two years later, he was diagnosed and successfully treated for prostate cancer. I mean, he went off and got prostate cancer. And I have to go get it, you know. I have a daughter named Gina. He has a daughter named Gina. I have a daughter named Sherry. He has a daughter named Sherry. He gets an award for the best actor. I get an award for television or whatever. And when he got prostate cancer, 
I said to myself, oh, my God. There are days when I haven't the slightest idea who the child is. I sent you a daughter. You are sending me a person who not only talks back, but also tells me where I went wrong. And goes on to suggest how I can redeem those ill-spent portions of my questionable life. And in 1996, Poitier returned to South Africa, where four decades before, he had allowed himself to become an indentured slave in order to appear and cry the beloved country. Now he was playing Nelson Mandela. I have started a process, the end of which cannot be predicted. I cannot say what tactics the regime will employ against me. I have to be constantly vigilant. And he's working more, he's working as a, he's a different person, a different actor now. And uh, that's exciting to contemplate. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to imagine the kind of pressure that the man must have been under knowing that he was the singular black male in film doing significant work. Um, if you think about the variety of African-American actors today who are making strides and who are doing lots of great work, myself, Mr. Washington, Mr. Snipes, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Dutton, Mr. Glover, Mr. Freeman, that's eight people. He had to do all of that by himself. Every single African-American actor and every actor of decency owes Mr. Poitier 10,000 thanks, 100,000 thanks, a million thanks. An icon goes out playing icons. Someday somebody will play Sidney Poitier. attention in this country to an underrated sport. Mm -hmm.